ربنا هادي له وصلواته وسلامه على افضل خلق الله على سيدنا وحبيبنا رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الله اكبر الله اكبر الله اكبر الحمد لله Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said للصائم فرحتان he has two joys one is the joy when he breaks his fast which is at each end of the day but also uh, at, on the Eid because we're bringing fast. And the second farha, the second joy is when uh, the faster meets their Lord. And the Prophet وسلم, uh, did not mean the joy of eating the food according to Imam Nawi. He meant the joy of completing an ibadah. That that's the joy, that you, you fulfilled something that your Lord commanded you to do. He would never look at something so low as eating food to be the joy of the believer. <laughs> so Alhamdulillah is a great blessing. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah, this is the second Ramadan in the COVID lockdown. It was very interesting. The Quran says, uh, you know, that the people in hell, they have over them 19. And it's like Allah's put over us this COVID-19 because humans have made the planet hell. The, the Quran says to the people of hell, Allah says to the people of hell, What's wrong with you that you don't help one another? Even in hell, they're not helping one another. In hell, they're not helping one another. What's wrong with you that you don't help one another? So even in hell, they haven't learned the lesson. Hellish people don't help one another. And the people of Jannah are people that help other people. They help one another. And that's the whole purpose of community. That's the purpose of the deen that we've been given is ta'awun al birri wa taqwa. Like help one another in birr and taqwa. Now the other thing about this uh, dunya is it's a darul bala. The Prophet وسلم, he said in a, in a hadith, they asked him, Su'ila Rasulullah sallallahu ayyun nasi ashaddu bala'an? Who, which people have the most, the worst tribulation in the dunya? He said, Al Anbiya'u, Fal Amthal Wal Amthal. First, the Prophets, the, the Prophets, Thumma Al Amthal Fal Amthal. And then after that, those who are closest to them, and then those that are closest to them. So the tribulations, Sahaba were, they were students of the Prophet. And what happens right when the Prophet goes? They have the tribulation of the fitna. They all start fighting one another. It's amazing. So this is the nature of dunya. It's always going to be tribulation. And if you accept that as a baseline, then you'll be much better off than people that think that they're here to enjoy paradise. The Prophet ﷺ said, dunya sijun al-mu'min. It's the prison of the believer. What do you do in prison? A lot of people, there was a man who was in prison in Alcatraz, and every night he would, uh, he had this little, there was a, a like a, a, a grate for where the air came in. So he took off the grate and he began to make a tunnel. Every single night, he would stay up the whole night and he would dig because he wanted to escape Alcatraz. He was a criminal, but he, every night he did that night work. He's the only person known to have escaped. He brought two people with him. But that is what a prisoner who wants to get out of his prison does. He does night work because he can't do it in the daytime. <laughs> so the, 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 the mu'min, he wants to get out of this prison. He does night work. The Prophet ﷺ said, help me with night work to get you out of the prison. Because this is a, a low security prison. The wow. next one is maximum security. <laughs> it's much worse than this one. This is the low security prison. So we should recognize that it's a great blessing to be in a low security prison. We even get uh, uh, spousal visitations. <laughs> Some prisons, they do that. They give them spousal visitation. It's a blessing. But know that this is just a big cell. When I used to be an imam in the prisons, I used to tell them, the only difference between you and the people outside is you know you're in prison. And your cell's much smaller than the cell outside. But this is a cell for the believer. And that's why the believer follows the injunctions of the warden. Mm. Because when you don't, you get your sentence to be longer. You're not going to get off for good behavior. When the parole board comes up, 
you, you won't have any excuse. They'll say, well, you did this and you did that. You got in those fights and you were stealing other prisoners' goods and you even murdered a prisoner here. They're not going to give you parole. So the, the, the dunya is a scission. So the Prophet ﷺ said, People will be given tribulation in accordance with their deen. It's commensurate with their deen. The greater your deen, the more tribulation you have. So the one who has a strong deen, a firm deen, he has great difficulty. And the one who has a weak deen, his tribulation is weaker. And a man will be continue to get affliction until he's walking on the earth like an angel. He's walking on the earth without sin. There's people, that's their condition. And you might, you don't know if you meet a person like that. They're walking on the earth. They've had so much tribulation in their life and they've been patient and content with what Allah gave them. And so they don't have any uh, sin because it's all been removed. And some of the salihin, and you see this, you see this in the Ahlul Bayt, at the end of their lives, they get grave tribulation. They have extended illnesses because they're going to leave the world without any tribulations. They're going to leave the world in a state of purity. There are many verses that tell us this. Whatever afflicts you from hasana is from Allah. And whatever afflicts you from any sayya, from any difficulties, is from your own self. And we sent you as a messenger to convey these messages to people so they, they would know. And all the messengers bring this message. The, the, this was the message. Even, even the Buddha, his, his teaching, the very first thing he taught his people, the world is suffering. You're going to have difficulty. That's the nature of it. And, and his, he said the cause was attachment. Because if you're detached, you're not going to suffer. If you're detached from your illness, if you just see this as, okay, this is part of the world. This is what, this is, this is what Allah intended in the creation. And, and then, in, in, in a riwayah. Whatever afflicts you, it's what your own hands have earned. It's what your own hands have earned. So that's something to understand also. There's two types of musiba. There's a musiba that comes by the very nature of the abode, like the tsunami uh, and, and other great, what, what they call natural evil, as opposed to moral evil. Moral evil is when you do something to another person, like somebody kills a person, as moral evil. Because he's a moral agent, he killed that person. But natural evil, it just occurs in the world. And a lot of people have a hard time with it. They don't understand it. Because it afflicts everybody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اتقوا فتنة لا تصيبن الذين ظلموا منكم خاصة Guard yourselves against tribulations that don't just affect the, the, the wrongdoers among you. The reason that, that the ulama say the reason this is so is because if it only afflicted, uh, afflicted the wrongdoers, then there would be no reason to do Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahi an al munkar But when they see that, oh, if we allow evil to proliferate, then we're all going to get affected by it. And that's why a, a wise philosopher said that the only thing evil needs to proliferate is for good people to do nothing. And so Allah has made the sunnah of this world that when people openly do evil, it affects everybody, even the children. That even children will suffer. So a lot of what you're seeing now is a result of the sinfulness of people. A lot of these diseases, you don't know where they came from. But the Prophet ﷺ said that perversions never manifest in a people except they get diseases that their, uh, their ancestors didn't know about. So even diseases, a lot of the sources of disease is the sinfulness of people. This is our belief. People don't want, they, everybody wants these materialistic, scientific uh, excuses. Inna l-insana an nafsi basira. Right? The, the human being Verily man knows himself Even if he gives his excuses 
So that's very important to remember that. And one of the things about that is he says, وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٌ in Surah Ashura, that he forgives many things. In other words, what we're getting compared to what we deserve is actually much less. So that's a blessing in itself, and that's why Ibn Abbas said, in any blessing, in any tribulation, see three blessings, so that you're grateful. Because the higher maqam is not to be patient, it's actually to be grateful. The first is that it could be worse. So that's a reason to be grateful. The second is that it's in your dunya and not in your deen. La tajan musibatana fi deenina, he said in a dua. Don't make our tribulation in the religion. So it's in the dunya, that's a blessing. And then he said the third was it's in this world and not the next. So any tribulation or calamity that happens to you, you have to say Alhamdulillah for those three reasons. So that's, that's, uh, that's really, really important. And also the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha relates that he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَا مِن مُصِيبَةٍ تُصِيبَ الْمُسْلِمَ إِلَّا كَفَرَ اللَّهُ بِهَا عَنْهُ سَيَّةٍ That no, uh, the, the, uh, nothing that, that uh, happens to you in any calamity, إِلَّا كَفَرَ اللَّهُ بِهَا عَنْهُ He will remove sins in that calamity. And there's a hadith also that إِذَا أَحَبَ اللَّهُ قَوْمًا أَبْتَلَاهُمْ فَإِذَا إِذَا رَضِيَ Right? Either if they were content, فَلَهُمْ رِضَى Then they get the contentment of Allah. وَإِذَا سَخِطَى But if they get angry, فَلَهُمْ سَخَطَى Then they, they get uh, the opposite. Mm-hmm. So that, and then he said, حَتَّى شَوْكَتُ Or شَوْكَتِ حَتَّى شَوْكَتُ Even the thorn that you get in your foot, يُشَاكُهَا That, that, that uh, afflicts the foot. When I, when I was in Mauritania, we'd walk and they have these things called initi. They're little, they really drive you nuts. The more time we would always say, la khair, the kafara. Like I would really, because they get all over your feet and their feet are like rocks because they walk all the time in the, whereas my feet were California feet. <laughs> they, they were much more sensitive. So they really, but they would, they looked at it as a good thing. They didn't see it as a negative thing. It's a different, their whole way of viewing, believers view things completely different. Uh, one Mauritanian, he asked me if they had flies in America. And I said, you know, actually we don't really have, because in Mauritania when they bring the food, a thousand flies, they're like a swarm of locusts. They just come, it's amazing. And they have to swat them away. Somebody sometimes just uh, keeps fanning so that others can eat from the flies. And, and, and I told him, uh, you know, I, you don't really see flies very often. He said, أعوذ بالله said, I seek refuge in Allah, they're getting all their blessings early. <laughs> like he just looked at it in a different way. Because that's the way the believer looks. So that's very important. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِلَّا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهَا حَسَنَا وَحَطَّ عَنْهُ بِهَا خَطِيئًا Allah will decree just even a thorn that you get a hasana with it. Because it's an ibtila. So that's very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he said, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاءِ like take uh, isti'ana in, in, in sabr and prayer, in patience and prayer. In Allah ma'asabirin, because Allah is with the sabirin. He's with the patient ones. So be patient. Sabr wa shukr. These are things Imam Ghazali puts them together because the Quran puts them together. They're very important. And then he says, what? Don't say about the people who were killed in the way of Allah that they're dead. They're not dead, but ahya. You're not aware of their life. So even when you lose people, and many people like COVID people, if you're a believer, it's a martyr's death. Sahaba, in, 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 in the year they had the, the, uh, the uh, plague in, in Syria, there was Sahaba that begged Allah to take them. They were, they were older people, but they begged a lot because they wanted a martyr's death. So, and they actually were taken in that. So they actually asked, even though we're not really supposed to ask for death, the Prophet said, don't ask for death. He said, Don't ask for death because of some calamity that affects you. وَإِن كَانَ لَا بُدَّ فَرْيَقُولُ أَحْيِنِي مَا دَامَتَ الْحَيَاةُ خَيْرًا لِي وَتُوَفَّنِي مَا كَانَتَ الْوَفَاةُ خَيْرًا لِي that if you have to say it, then say, keep me alive as long as life is good for me and let me die when, when death is better for me. 
And I'm going to talk about that uh, in a moment. So then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُزِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشَّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ He's going to test you in the dunya. So give good tidings to the people who show patience. What do they do? الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ so that is, is, those are the people that when they're afflicted, they, they remind themselves. It's a reminder to yourself. I, I belong to God, so God can do whatever He wants with His, uh, with His dominion. I belong to God. And, and one of the things, a lot of the tribulation, like it said, I was talking about the two types of musibah, so that you have the natural ones, and then you also have things, sometimes just genetically, you're more predisposition to certain illnesses. That's a ibtida from Allah, it's not your fault. But if you're overeating, if you're not exercising, if you're doing these things, and then you get sick, you, you have only yourself to blame. That, because there's things that you can do. Health, health is a choice for a lot of people. It's a choice. Like, you choose to be healthy by doing the things Allah told you to do to stay healthy. If you don't do those things and then you get sick, then you have no one to blame but yourself. So that's, that's very important uh, to remember that. And then, one of the things about tribulation, the Prophet ﷺ said, يَوَدُّ أَهْلَ الْعَافِيَةِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ حِينَ يُعْطَى أَهْلُ الْبَلَاءِ الثَّوَابِ لَوْ أَنَّ جُلُودُهُمْ كَانَتْ قُرِضَتْ بِالْمَقَارِيضِ I mean, this is an amazing hadith Imam al-Tirmidhi relates it. He said that on the, on the Day of Judgment, when the people who had good health and well-being in dunya, because some people, they don't, they, they're blessed like that, it, and it is a blessing. We don't want tribulation. We, we ask Allah for afiyah. The Prophet said, ask Allah for well-being. But if it comes to you, he said, be patient. So we don't ask, oh, give me tribulation. But he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is tasliya for the people of tribulation. It's a way of consoling and solace for the people of tribulation. He said that on the day of judgment, when the people of well-being in the world see the people of tribulation, they will wish that they could go back to the dunya and have their skin flayed with scissors, like literally cut off, because that's the way they used to torture people. They, you know, you call them flaying them alive. They would wish that that was their tribulation. So the point is that whatever, don't ask for tribulation. We don't want tribulation. But if you get it, you have to understand that it's not a, it's not a negative thing for believers. There's redemption in it. There, there's a reason for it. Now, if you look at the Prophet Sallallahu life, who had more tribulation? He had tribulation, he was an orphan. People have no idea. If, if there's any orphans here, they know exactly what I'm talking about. But people that had the blessing of two parents, or even one parent, to grow up without parents, the people that brought you into the world, their sabah for your existence, the reason for your existence, just to have parents, to have parents for a long time. You know, the Sudanese proverb says, that you're a child as long as your parents are alive. Because even if you're 50 years old, your parents will treat you, you know, you're, you're just their kid. That's the way they'll do it. Especially the ladies know this more than the men because they, they have this, and, and that's natural. But when they die, you're an orphan. And you feel it. It doesn't matter how old you are. You feel like something's been lost in the dunya uh, that, that, that you can't get back. And, and, and people who've lost their parents know exactly what I'm talking about. The ones that haven't yet, just honor your parents. And, 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 and call them and, and visit them if you're able to. Because they're a great blessing to have. And they love you. And it's an unconditional love. It's an amazing type of love. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi lost his parents. And then he lost his uncle. And then he had, he, he had uh, many tribulations. And then... When the prophecy came, his people chased him out. In fact, uh, Waraka told him, you know, I wish I was with you. Waraka ibn Nofel, who was uh, Khadijah's relative, when she took him, she knew to take him because he knew about the scriptures. And she thought it was revelation. And he confirmed it. He said, this is the namus, the nomos, the law that came to Moses. When Waraka 
he said, I wish I was a young man so that I could be with you to support you when your people chased you out. He said, oh, huh? like they're going to chase me out. He couldn't understand it. Like, why would they do that? He was Al-Amin. He was from a noble clan. But that's the sunnah of the prophets. That, that, a, that a prophet hath no honor in his own land. And this is the sunnah of the prophets. They get chased out. So that's a, a huge tribulation to lose your clan especially in a, a tribal society. And then he went to Medina and all, his life is tribulation. He lost all of his children except for one. He buried six of his children. I mean, who, who, who has done that? Very few people. And then he, you know, he, he, his sickness was the sickness of double, twice. Any sickness he got was twice the natural sickness. So if he got a headache, it was twice as bad as anybody else. So th this, this was the way, this is the, our Prophet When he had the, he, Aisha asked him what was the worst period, he said it was when he went to Ba'if. That was the worst thing. And he said, your people, what your people did to me. Because mm -hmm. you know, the Prophet is really not of this world. I mean, he had the physical form of an Arab, mm -hmm. but he was not of this world. When, when, when he went to uh, Ba'if, they, they, they literally threw rocks at him. After he called them to Islam, they threw rocks at him. And then, and then they, the, the, the people spit on him. And the slave, they had their slaves, which is even more humiliating. They didn't even do it themselves. And so when he was going out, the angel came to him, him and said, do you want to destroy these people? He said, no, I hope that they'll be guided. And, and that was a test for him. Allah was testing him. But he, his dua, the famous dua, he said, Allahumma ilayka ashku ba'fa quwwati. I complained my weakness. See, he didn't say ashku qawmi or Ash, ashku ha'ulai. This is what we do now today. We complain about everybody but ourselves. He didn't say ashku ha'ula bani hawazim, bani thaqif. He didn't complain about them. He said ashku ba'fa quwwati wa qillata hirati. And, and my lack of strategy. Like I went there, I tried. He's, he's complaining about himself. Like maybe I wasn't good enough. Maybe I didn't present it the best way. That's what I, he's, he's not blaming them for rejecting the message. He's blaming himself. This is an amazing lesson in this dua. And then he said, وَهَوَانِي عَلَى النَّاسِ He didn't say, وَإِهَانَةَ nas iyaya. He said, I complain to you my insignificance in the eyes of the people. He didn't say their contempt for me. He said, Hawani ala nas, my insignificance. That's a stunning statement. Ya Arham al Rahimin. Look at the name he calls by. Oh, most merciful of those who show mercy. Antarabban Mustadafim. You are the Lord of the, the oppressed. You are the like he's he's clearly Mustadaf here. And he says, you are the Lord of the oppressed. Wa anta rabbi, and you are my Lord. He didn't put himself in the oppressed. He just said, wa anta rabbi, as if he's not one of them. Like, I'm not complaining, I'm oppressed. He said, you're the Lord of the oppressed. Wa anta rabbi. So he doesn't put himself in there. He's saying, you know, the, the mustadafin, wa anta rabbi. Ila man takilni, who are you going to lead me to? He's saying, you brought me to these people. Are you going to lead me to these people? From these distant people that will treat me terribly. Or to an enemy. Look at the tawheed here. He's not seeing the people as having some kind of power outside of Allah's power. Allahumma malik al-mulk, tuti al-mulk man tasha. That's his maqam. His maqam is he sees everything from Allah. All the tribulations that are coming in the dunya, he's not seeing, oh, these evil people, these evil kuffar, these evil people that have conquered our land. You know, he's saying, anta malaktuhum amri. Right? So then he says, as long as you're not upset with me, as long as you're not angry at me, I'm not, I'm not bothered by it. The Arabs say, it means I'm not giving it any consideration. So all these tribulations that he's being afflicted by, he's saying, as long as you're not upset with me. 
And then he says, But well-being is, is, it's more comfortable. It's more comfortable. Um, I seek refuge in the light of your countenance by which the entire creation is illuminated. All the darknesses are removed. And everything in the dunya and the afterlife is made right. That you should uh, reveal your wrath to me. Or I should be enveloped with your anger. You can censor me until you're pleased. You can censor me. You can say whatever you want to me until you're pleased. That we ask for forgiveness. Us asking forgiveness until you're pleased. That's how he ends it. Tawheed. لا حول بين وبين المعصية ولا قوة على الطاعة إلا بك. I cannot be prevented from doing ma'asiyah without your help, and I cannot be consistent in my obedience without your help. So that's really uh, important. And then, so in that situation, there's sabr and shukr. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Ya yuhal ladina amin wa sabiru wa sabiru wa rabitu wa taqulah." Like, be patient and enjoin tawasul bi sabr. You know, enjoin one another to be patient. And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Inna ma yuwafa sabiruna adrohum bi ghairi hisab." You are going to be given without any reckoning your patience in that. Astainu bi sabri wa sara. All of the verses in the Quran, in Allah ma'as sabri, and all these sayings are to remind us of this. And then the second maqam is shukr. And, and shukr is, it's gratitude, it's higher than patience. In the Fidari Kadayatan, the Kuri Sabar and Shakur. He prefaces that verse in Surah Ibrahim with the verses about Moses reminding them about Pharaoh. And then at the end of it, he says, With Ta'adhana Rabbukum and Shakartum Layzidanakum. That if you're patient, if you're grateful, Allah will increase you. That is preceded by him reminding them about the Ulkuru Alaikum Ali Fara'un. Remember the blessing of Allah when He saved you from the people of Fara'un. Yasumunu kum suwar adab. We the Bihuna Abnaakum we stahyun and isakum. Wafidarika Balaun min Rabbikum Adin. In that is a tribulation from your Lord. That's Tawheed. It wasn't Fara'un. Muslims have lost this understanding. For some reason, I, my only conclusion is they don't read the Quran. And if they read it, they don't lay it to That's all my only conclusion about it because it's all there in the book. And when you have that perspective, Allah is going to give you victory just like He gave the Prophet I said, victory. That dua is an amazing dua because that was His tawheed. What does Imam al Ghazali in the Ihya? He puts tawheed with tawakkul. Tawheed and tawakkul are together because if you don't have that tawheed, you won't. And then when Iblis swears his oath that he's, you know, that I'm going to sit and wait on your straight path. Right? And then he's, he's going, So he's going to wait. In life. And what does he say? You won't find the majority of them grateful. So that's his strategy to make you all ingrates. Which is the real meaning of kafir. A disbeliever is an ingrate. And that's Iblis' strategy, because he was ungrateful. So he wants to reduce everybody to a state of ingratitude, uh, which is tragic, right? So, but anyway, the tribulations are all, you know, they're all part of the dunya. And, and we have to remember that this is, you know, hikam and nushijat biyadin hakamat, thumman tusijat. Uh, you know, like uh, he says in the Munfarija, that all these tribulations are from a wise creator, woven with a wise hand, the warp and woof of which come together. Right? So you have to see that, that it's all in Allah's plan. And just like the ant can't see that pattern on the carpet, we can't see the plan of Allah, but everybody's in the plan of Allah. They're in the plan of Allah. All of their strategies are in the plan of Allah. 
and everything will come to pass that was meant to come to pass. The next thing I wanted to talk about was Ramadan was a time when people go back to the Book of Allah. Now, you're obviously there's natu- uh, supernatural facilitation, and I'll be the first to admit this, because we all know that something happens the moment that this is amazing. You can feel it. You know, somebody said, uh, uh, Imam Majid's uh, uh, daughter, he, he told me, I think it was Imam, no, it was uh, uh, somebody from uh, Chicago told me that their daughter said, I felt like I had this really tight embrace from Ramadan, and the moment the Eid came, I felt the embrace was released. So there's a supernatural event with Ramadan. But the point of Ramadan is, if you had a connection to Allah it's, it, with, with the Qur'an, it's to strengthen that connection. If you didn't have one, it's to, it's to reconnect you with the Book of Allah. But the purpose is not to let today, suddenly, uh, that connection is over until the next Ramadan. At least if it's in Ramadan, that's a blessing for some people, alhamdulillah, that they're still connected. Because there are a lot of people that aren't connected anymore. They don't even fast. I mean, it's the first time in Muslim history, I think, where you're, you're seeing this phenomenon. It's, it's really quite tragic. And I always tell people, don't be the link that breaks the chain. There's people here from Muslim countries, Afghanistan, Syria, Palestine, different places, uh, India, Pakistan, over a thousand years. That's why you're Muslim. Because for a thousand years, for 14, in some cases, 1400 years, each generation transmitted this truth to the next generation. They don't think they didn't have tribulation. They had plagues. They lost their whole families. They had wars. They had the Mongols. They had the Christians. The people had their tongues cut out for teaching Quran in Andalusia. That's a historical fact. They, had, they, had, they were tortured in the Inquisition. All those things. And so now, because things were a little difficult, you're going to leave the deen? Subhanallah. I mean, shame on those people for betraying all of their ancestors. Because I guarantee you, there's nobody who was born Muslim from coming from a long line that didn't have awliya in their family. I have no doubt. And those awliya did not bring people into the world for them to be profligate, for them to forget their Lord, to forget their Creator. So that's really important. So come back to the Book of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith that Imam Muslim relates that Abu Huraira told us that that no group of Muslims gets together in a house from the houses of Allah. They recite the Book of Allah, but then look, and they study it together. And this is a very important uh, hadith because we've abandoned this practice. People have personal uh, recitation, but the idea of actually coming together to reflect on the Book of Allah and study it together. You will be enveloped in sakina. There's a hadith where a man had a horse, one of the Sahaba had a horse, and he, was, he, he tied his horse with the habr, and then he was reciting it, and, and it was very hot in you know, Arabia, and a cloud came, Sahaba, he called it Sahaba, came and covered him, and the horse was like looking up and moving away. So he went to the Prophet and he told him, This book tafaqan alayh, and he said, هذه السكينة التي تنزل عند قراءة القرآن. This is the sakina that comes in the recitation of the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ said that he أمرت أن أكون من المسلمين وأن أتلو القرآن. I was commanded to be from the the Muslims and to recite the Quran. Why did he put those two together? The Quran puts those two together. That you were commanded to be a Muslim and to recite the Quran. So don't be the people that Allah, the Prophet ﷺ complained about. Inna qawmi yatakhudu hadha al-Qur'ana mahjura. My people have abandoned this book. And Abu Hanifa says, he's the most generous. He says at least read it twice a year. So you're not from those. But Imam al-Ghazali says once a month. That if you're not doing it once a month, it's like you've abandoned it. He actually says that's had al-adna. And, then, and I'm telling this to you, I, normally I wouldn't do this. Like when I taught the class, 
because you, all of you are, I know you're strong people, so it's not gonna overwhelm you. But for, for other people, if I was speaking to a public audience, I would not say, can I just get them to read like a paragraph a day or half a page? Because you have to know your audience. If you say, uh, uh, read a juice a day, uh, I, and then they don't do anything because they feel overwhelmed. That's part of the problem in the Muslim world is you have these imams on the mimbars that are constantly berating the believers. And then they feel like, that, or they completely associate uh, uh, deen and khuluq. So the person that doesn't have deen has no khuluq. Instead of recognizing that khuluq, there's people without Islam that have good, excellent moral character. But in the, in the Muslim world, they always conflate the two, even though the Prophet ﷺ separated them. Man ja'aka yurdikum deenuhu wa khuluquhu. He didn't say deenuhu faqat, assuming that khuluq is in there. He said deenuhu wa khuluquhu. Because they, they, they're, not, they, they're not together. There's people that have deen and no khuluq. And there's people that have khuluq and no deen. And the best people are the people that have deen and khuluq. That's why he said, if they come, then marry them. Zawijuhum, like marry them your children. So that's really important to do that. And they, and they will be mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So this Quran that Allah says, ma faratna fil kitab min shay, Allah didn't leave anything out in the book. Right? It's tafsir and kulli shay. It's, it will clarify everything. So this is really, really important uh, to do, to to get back to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tafsil al-kulli shayin. Wa tibyan al-kulli shayin. So that's really important. And then uh, finally about the Qur'an, in, in the famous hadith that Imam An-Nawi relates, he said, وَالْقُرَانُ حُجَّةً لَكَ وَعَلَيْكَ This Qur'an is going to be a hujjah for you or against you. So make it a hujjah for you. And the way you do that is to keep it with you, to recite it, and then to apply it as best you can. Uh, Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran will come on the Day of Judgment and actually they will fight for your salvation. And it's a hadith. To hajjan an sahibihima. The Prophet said, if you recite Al-Baqarah in your house, shaitan will not come into your house for three days. Baqarah. Two and a half uh, it takes about an hour and a half. So shaitan won't come into your house. So if you're feeling something going on in your house, recite Baqarah and, and they'll leave. They have to leave. They can't stay. So it's really important. Also mulk is really important. The Prophet said, three, 30 ayahs, I, I, I wish was in the heart of every believer. Reciting that every night. The Prophet said, it will come in your grave and it will defend you. If you recite every night, the Prophet, these are called Qawari al Quran. These are the striking things in the Quran that will fight for you. The Prophet said, No one will read Ayatul Kursi after every prayer except there will be nothing between him and Jannah except death. <laughs> so these are all gifts from, uh, from our deen. So it's, it's really important to do that. So, and then the Prophet said, Everyone will arise every, every single day. You're either um, saving yourself or destroying yourself. There's a choice. It was great philosopher said, every moment is an ethical moment. Because there's always a choice in every moment to do the right thing or to do the wrong thing. Every moment, that's your life. So that's, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you all the Prophet ﷺ said that in a hadith that's in uh, the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba, he says, Al baytu idha tuliya fihi kitab Allah tasa' bi ahlihi. If a, 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 a house in which the, the book of Allah is recited will actually expand for the family. And this is, people, you have kings that feel constricted in their palaces. Wallahi, I guarantee you, there are kids. Qaddafi, every night he had to sleep in a different place. Every night, because he was worried about assassination. So you have people that they're in this vast expanse and they, they don't, they don't. Uh, and, then, and then when, when, uh, when Isa, there's a hadith in, in, in our tradition where Isa, Jesus, when, when, when they, they were burying somebody 
and somebody said, Ma al qabr? You know, how constricted is the qabr? And he said, for the believer, it's like the womb of his mother. The womb expands as you grow. Right? So, so the, the bigger your soul gets, the bigger your grave is going to be. I mean, that, that's the reality of it. And for others, it's going to be real constriction. These are all truths of our religion. And then he said, khayruhu. You will see much good in that house. From reciting the Quran, much good in that house. You will get what you need. And then the angels want to visit because the angels, according to, just like we see the lights in the night sky, there's traveling angels that look for places of dhikr. Wherever there's places where the Quran is recited, they see them like we see the stars. And they go to those places. And when there's a khatam, the 70,000 come. You're just flooded with them. So these are great gifts to have. They're real. This is all real. It's all real. It's not made up. This is not mythology. This is real. We're just not aware of it. We're just, we're, and, and the more present you get, the more aware you're going to be of these things. And then he said, and he said, Look at all the, you know, just the shayateen of, like people watch films of shayateen, literally shayateen. That, you know, they fill their house with filth. There's people watching shayateen uh, fornicate in their homes. Like it's, it's, it's amazing what's going on out there, all of this sickness. So make your house a house of light, not a house of darkness. A house that if the Prophet ﷺ came, just imagine one night you get a knock at the door and you open it and it's the Messenger of Allah visiting you. Just imagine if you invited him into your house, if he would see anything that would trouble him. I mean, just think about your house. Is it a place where you would feel comfortable bringing the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu in. And then the, the, the one who recites Quran, the Prophet said that a man who has no Quran in him is like a derelict house that has no, uh, no one residing in it. And he said that on the day of Qiyamah, Allah will say, Iqra warqa. Like, read and rise in a riwayah wartaqi. Read and rise. Like your place with Allah is going to be in the last thing that, that, that you, uh, the last ayah that you read. So that's very important. And then finally, I just want to say uh, that death comes to all of us and we know, we, no one knows when death will come, but it will come. All of us have an appointment. We know Basically, it's going to be within 70, 80, 90, maybe 100, maybe 110. Um, but it's coming. And it could come at just when you're young. It could. People, we lost people, people we loved, we lost them. Young, beautiful people we lost in accidents and other things or from sickness. Death will come. And all people love life. Even rarely, suicide is actually much rarer than one would think it would be, if you think about it. The type of suffering on this planet and the type of things people go through. I mean, there's, this, and people that commit suicide. They tend to be extremely sensitive people. that uh, they just get overwhelmed. And the prohibitions are really strong because you have to be strong in the dunya. You can't let this place uh, tear you down. You have to be strong. This is a place for strong people. This isn't a place for weary-hearted people. This is a place for strong people. And the thing that will strengthen you is faith. And that's why Suicide usually comes when people, I mean, there's mental illnesses and Allah, inshallah, will forgive those people. Uh, but suicide usually comes when there's despair. They despair. And I'll tell you one story. There's a man who does suicide prevention all over this country. He decided to kill himself. 
and he went to the Golden Gate Bridge. And he said that if anybody asked him how he was doing on the way, he wouldn't kill himself. That's what he told himself. So he's on a bus and he gets to the last stop where the bridge is and the bus driver looked down and he was clearly despondent. And he said, look buddy, the ride's over, you need to get off. So he went and he jumped off the bridge and he said the moment, he's one of the few people that survived that bridge. Very few, over 300 people traditionally killed themselves on the bridge every year. Right. He survived, but he said the moment he jumped, he said, this is a mistake. The moment, and I think that's what every single person who commits suicide will, will, will say. This is a mistake. When he landed, he broke almost every bone in his body. A seal came. <laughs> and held him up. Because it wasn't time to go. A seal came and held him up he, and, and just held him until the, the lifeguard got there, you know, the patrol. And they just told him, you have no idea how lucky you are because we pull dead people out all the time. And he realized how lucky he was. And that's why what he does for the rest of his life is to try to prevent people from killing themselves because of the gift of life. But also, death is a gift. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Death is the gift of the believer. It's a gift. One of them said, لا تظن الموت موتا النهوت لا حياة وهو غاية المنا Don't think death is death. It is life, mm. and it is your heart's desire. La turakum hashmatul moti, for ma'hu illa intiqarun min huna. Don't be afraid of this death that's going to force itself on you, because it's just moving from this place to another place. Fakhla'u al-ajsad min anfusikum tubsir al-haqa ayyan al-bayyina. So throw off these mortal coils and see the truth as an eyewitness. That's, that's death. When, when Socrates went to, uh, you know, they were gonna, uh, his trial, they said, what do you think your punishment should be? He said, you should give me free meals for the rest of my life because I'm doing the state a great service by bothering everybody. <laughs> and and then he's, when they sent him to death, he said, I'm not worried because on my way, my spirit guide told me that death is a good thing. And he said, we're afraid of death because we don't know what's coming after. And that's where the fear of death comes. And then finally, the Prophet ﷺ, and remember, everything was more difficult for him in this dunya, including his death. There's a hadith in Al-Bukhari that when it was thaqul al nabi it was really heavy for him. And great distress was upon him. His daughter was with him, and she said, what distress, oh my father. And he replied, There's no more distress after today for your father. He said, يا أبتا جنة الفردوس ما ويا أبتا إلى جبية تنعى فلما دفيا. so then she said, oh my father, you answered your your Lord's prayer when he called you. oh my father, the highest paradise is where you're headed. oh my father, Jibril will announce your death. 
So it's a great blessing and we should guard our lives and protect them and, 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 and just feel grateful to be alive. But we shouldn't fear that because it's also a great blessing. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah make us all believers and make the last words we say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Aqulu qulri had wa astaghfirullah. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam tisima Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Alhamdulillahi, Alhamdulillahi ala itmami Ramadan Allahumma taqabal minna ta'atina Allahumma fillana taqsirana Allahumma barak fi siyam, fi siyamina wa qiyamina Allahumma أقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تقول به بين الأمم بيننا وبين معصيك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغ به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا أبدا ما أحييتنا وجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ومصنع على من عادانا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مدرق علمنا ولا غاية رغبتنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تصل لا علينا في ذنوبنا من لا يخافك ولا يرحمك اللهم فرج عن المسلمين في كل مكان وفي القدس وفي فلسطين اللهم فرج عنهم يا الله اللهم زع عليهم السكينة اللهم انصرهم يا الله أنت العزيز أنت الغفار أنت الكبير أنت المتعالي أنت المتكبر يا الله اللهم أرينا قوتك في فيهم يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرينا قدرتك عليهم يا الله أنت أرحم الراحمين فرحمنا وتب علينا اللهم اغفر لنا واغفر المسلمين في كل مكان اللهم بارك في مشايخنا في مشارق الأرض من غاربها اللهم اجعلنا من أهل القرآن اللهم اجعلنا من أهل القرآن اللهم اجعل القرآن جلاء قلوبنا اللهم اجعل القرآن جلاء قلوبنا وربيع قلوبنا اللهم اجعله ذهاب همومنا وغمومنا اللهم اجعل القرآن قرينا منا في قبورنا اللهم اجعل القرآن أنيسا لنا في دنيانا اللهم اجعل القرآن دائما على ألسنتنا يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أحفظنا منه ما نسينا اللهم يا الله اجعلنا من الذين يصدقون القرآن اللهم اجعلنا من الذين يستمعون الكلام فيتبعون أحسنا اللهم اجعلنا من الذين أنت قدت فيهم قد أفلح المؤمنون اللهم اجعلنا من الذين قدتم فيهم قد أفلح المؤمنون اللهم اجعلنا مداومين على صرواتنا اللهم اجعل آخر كلماتنا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله وصلى الله على سيد محمد وعلى أرض وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المسلم ورحمة الله رب العالمين عيدكم مبارك إن شاء الله يحب بباري تجن أيور وفاك الكتار إن شاء الله it's معلقه the the siyam until you pay it so inshallah barakallahu fikum assalamu alaykum